Welcome to this webinar about human design, the introduction to human design. My name is Jakub and I'm talking to you from Prague, Czech Republic, where I live. I've done this presentation many times live in front of the live audience and mostly here in Czech Republic, but I've also done it uh, several times in English. Um, and the way I describe human design obviously evolves the longer I study it, the longer I'm involved in it professionally. Uh, the things that I say change and evolve, just like uh, everybody is evolving, our work is evolving as well. And so this is going to be my current take on uh, the topic of human design and hopefully I'll be able to introduce you this very complicated system in a way uh, that uh, is very uh, practical and clear, just like uh, the reading itself uh, is working with this very complicated system, but the, the, the outcome for a client hopefully is very clear cut, very practical, down to earth. And just um, let's go for it. Okay, so you can see it says here, live the life that you were born to live. It's a, uh, it's a reference to the human design and its main objective to be aligned with our energy and to really be able to fully live out our gifts and talents in the world. Um, the man that brought the human design uh, to uh, the world uh, uh, named Ra Uruhu, you can see his picture here, uh, was a manifester who lived in Ibiza uh, in Spain and in 1987 had an encounter with the voice, as he called it. And uh, he was told all kinds of things and human design was just one of them. And uh, then he spent the next five years of his life very, uh, in a very detailed oriented work um, so that he could transmit, so that he could uh, bring this uh, system to the public in a way that is practical, that is uh, that is understandable and that is valuable. And so, um, what were the things that Ra was told by the voice? And by the way, there is a, uh, a movie called Encounter, which you can see on YouTube, where he describes the voice, the experience with the voice. And, uh, but also he, he um, stresses that it's not really important how the human design came to be. The important thing is that we try it out for ourselves and that we don't get involved in it so that we study it for its aesthetic beauty, beauty, but we actually live it. And that's always the challenge. So, so here is the first slide, and uh, some of those beautiful illustrations are created by my teacher, General Oblivion of Human Design America, and sometimes slightly adjusted by me. So this is the slide which uh, describes one of the, uh, the main premises of human design, that um, Ravos given, uh, which is that uh, we were born uh, for many millennia, for many thousands of years as people with uh, seven centers, with seven energetic centers. And these are obviously uh, the seven chakras uh, as we know them from, from Hindu system, from, from India, from East. And uh, in 1781, around the time that the planet Uranus was discovered by uh, German astrologer William Herschel, uh, we began to be born, we as human beings, with nine energy centers. And we really went through this quantum shift, this, this big shift in the evolution of our form and therefore also of our consciousness. Why do I put form first? Because the form is what enables our consciousness to be present in this, uh, in this world, in this, in this dimension of forms. Okay? If, if we didn't have a body, we wouldn't be able to participate in this game of creation. So, so the body and our form sets total uh, limitations and also allows us to function in a very specific ways and the fact that we shifted from seven energy centers to nine, seven, nine energy centers is uh, uh, very significant because uh, what happened is that some of those centers, two of those seven uh, centers split in two. Uh, you can see on, on the image on the right hand side here where there is this uh, 
brown triangle on the far right and uh, it's the center of solar plexus you can see gate 37 for example there and it's mirror opposite on the left hand side of of the body graph with uh, which is the brown triangle with gate 48 for example which is the splenic center these two energy centers were uh, prior to this uh, evolutionary shift just one center and what does it mean well, it basically means that our capacity for seeing and perceiving the reality in our own life and, and everything around us is more pronounced, it's more detailed. It's like these centers are organs of perception. These centers are really uh, like eyes or windows through which we are looking out into the world and we are relating to different themes of our life. And uh, by these, uh, through these centers, we are, we are uh, able to see and perceive certain energies and information. Now, solar plexus on the far right, on this, in this image of the body graph, is about emotions, emotional realities. It's about passions, desires, moods, uh, relational intelligence. It's about waves of emotion up and down, up and down. The splenic center on the left-hand side of the body graph is about survival and health, staying healthy and being able to survive through following our instincts and intuition. Okay, it's very instinctual, it's very um, uh, intuitive center. These are both centers of, of awareness. We become aware through them of certain things. Now, prior to uh, the evolution of nine-centered vehicle, we were in a seven-centered body. These two centers were just one center, third chakra, okay? And so when you met somebody in a forest or outside of your village and you were down on your emotional wave or you just had a bad mood, it was, you, you perceived that person as a threat to your survival and, and you took out a knife or a sword and kill them before they kill you. That was the world of very strategic, uh, very old strategic seven-centered beings, which, which no longer actually is our today's reality, but we still live in, in its influence. This world of seven-centered beings was the world where the mind was on the top of hierarchy. And um, actually all these centers were aligned in a very hierarchical order. You can see these chakras on the image on the left hand side uh, where there is one above another. They are stacked on top of each other like a deck of cards. And the spiritual work that for example yogis in India were involved in was about uh, dealing with the reality of the first chakra and then once that was stabilized in a way and dealt with then one could progress to the second chakra and then third and so on and so forth. It was very hierarchical, uh, spiritual way, very, uh, very strategic. And also the, the way these people uh, lived and, uh, and functioned was very strategic. You know, they were really uh, in need of finding ways of how to survive and being very strategic about it. Um, I read the biography of Julius Caesar and that is just a wonderful example of how how seven-centered beings were so strategic, you know, how he conquered uh, entire France and a large part of Germany and Belgium within 10 years and, you know, against overwhelming, uh, uh, be, he being outnumbered by, by all those uh, tribes that, that used to live there. Uh, it was a very strategic way, you know, this Roman imperialism, which which of course is something that we kind of still live in because it progressed into modern ages. And just because we made this shift, it doesn't mean that our way of functioning in the world immediately changed. You know, we were here for really tens of thousands of years living in the seven-centered body. And this shift is a really big jump, quantum jump. And we need to learn to live in this new reality, in this nine-centered vehicle, and this very new and very receptive vehicle that we, that we uh, you know, occupy. Its, uh, its main benefit is that we no longer need the hierarchies. We don't need somebody above us or below us. We can be equal 
You know, all those nine energy centers in the nine centered vehicle are uh, ideally in harmony and synchronized with one another. It doesn't make sense to say, okay, I'm going to be working on the solar plexus, and then when I when I once I deal with that, I can work on on the on the G center. Once I deal with that, I can work on on the throat center. Makes no sense because everything is connected and and in harmony in in the nine center vehicle, and therefore our new spirituality is really about being receptive, giving up the mind as a source of decision making. And being really receptive and, and, and very sensitive to ourselves and what is it that our energy actually tells us because really it's the form that sets the rules you know it's the design part of us that deals the cards yeah they, it, we need to uh, you know to be really fulfilled which means different things for different people obviously we need to honor our form and uh, I'm, I'm just reading some of the comments here Okay, honor our form and be sensitive to what our energy tells us. And human design is very unique in, it, in, in its capacity to very precisely uh, point out what does it actually mean to follow your own energy, to let your energy guide you. There is usually in, in vast majority, in, in let's say 97%, 98% of charts, there is a, there is a, a center one of the defined centers, one of these card in centers in the in the body graph, which is which is the place of authority, what we call inner authority. It's the place where we energetically reach decisions, and so um, this is really very unique about human design that it offers us a way of making decisions which doesn't come from the mind, and therefore is not conditioned decision, but it's a con but it's a decision that reflects our inner makeup. Our design. Okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide. These are just some of the characteristics of the nine centered beings. And I'm just going to leave it here for a little while. You can pause it in the recording if you are watching this uh, uh, from the recording. And, um, you know, we are here to really look and see and understand and speak for ourselves. And, and really interact with others with respect. It's just some of the things that uh, Genoa put together. I think it's a really beautiful slide and uh, uh, hopefully it's going to be something that impart, inspires you. And let's see, um, let's take a look at the mandala of human design and I'm going to walk you through it and speak about all the different things that you can actually see here. Now, uh, in the outer layer of the mandala what you can see here is that uh, you can see this uh, circle of uh, I Ching hexagrams and uh, they are actually um, also called gates in human design you can see here. and each hex hexagram represents uh, an archetypal gift and talent potential that we as human species together carry. There is altogether 64 of these hexagrams and together uh, they represent the, the totality of our potential. And um, perhaps some of you know uh, I Ching uh, is an uh, ancient uh, divination technique. Um, we in human design uh, don't really use the description of these hexagrams as it appears in the tra traditional I Ching, uh, uh, Chinese Book of Changes, but we have uh, a specific uh, rave I Ching, which was written by Rao Ruhu, and it assigns uh, slightly different names. Uh, so each hexagram has two names, the traditional name and also the name given by Ra. For example, hexagram 48 uh, is called uh, 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 the well, in, in, in traditional Chinese I Ching, and in, in human design it's called the gate of wisdom so or depth so uh, you can see how it relates very closely now uh, one layer towards the center you can see astrological zodiac astrological mandala um, uh, zodiac and with these uh, 12 uh, signs of zodiac the traditional uh, signs of zodiac now the reason why we have them here 
is really only for us to be able to place positions of planets in the moment when we were born and to assign them to the specific hexagrams, gates, okay? So for example, if somebody was born with their moon in uh, Scorpio, like uh, I was, and this is my chart, you can see Scorpio being on the right uh, uh, top corner of the, of the mandala. It looks like M a little bit. There is gate one, first gate, and the moon was there uh, when I was born, and therefore, uh, because we know it was a certain degree of Scorpio, that's how we assign that the moon actually activates gate number one, first gate in this particular chart. And you can see if you look in the very center of the mandala, in this yellow diamond shape uh, uh, center, which is called G center, on the very top of it is first gate, gate one, and it's activated. Um, again, we don't work with the qualities of uh, zodiac, uh, the, the traditional astrological zodiac, uh, but I can I can use this uh, as a as a as a way of um, describing how how we're looking at this uh, human design mandala. Is instead of looking at the mandala as mandala having twelve different parts and each part certain characteristic. You can, you can look at a man, human design mandala as, uh, as a mandala with 64 different parts with very specific, uh, concrete uh, characteristics. Now, in the middle of the, of the mandala, obviously, you can see the body graph, which is uh, also called the chart. And this is how the chart looks. And um, you've probably seen yours, uh, I believe. And so let me walk you through it and, and show you uh, what you can see actually when you look at this chart. Uh, one of the first things that you probably notice is that um, it, it is uh, an outline of a human being, of a human body. And within that outline, you can see these nine energy centers. And straight away, you can see that some of them are colored in as we call defined, and some of them are white, open, undefined. Um, the reason these uh, centers that are colored in are colored in is because uh, there are gates activated on both ends of the channel. For example, if you look at gate 21 in the ego center, which is the red triangle slightly to the right in the middle of the body graph, Gate 21, the gate of control, is activated by the um, design side. It's in red. I'll speak about that in a moment. Now, um, on the other end of this channel, in the throat center, this brown uh, square, um, is gate 45, which is activated also. And because of that, these two gates create a constant energetic connection. It's like uh, my whole life, there is a an inter interchange. There is this energetic freeway, highway between these two energy centers, between the center of willpower, the ego center, and the, the center of communication and manifestation, the throat center. And therefore, because these two centers are in this constant communication with one another my, my whole life, that is the reason why these two centers are defined. You know, they're colored in because the way they function is forever predetermined by their connection by their, uh, uh, you know, by this channel which joins them together. It's a quantum, quantum. It's, it's something more than just one gate plus one gate. It creates a third kind of energy which really is very uh, 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 powerful uh, potential. You know, these channels are one of our strongest gifts and talents that we carry. It's what really defines us on a very deep fundamental level. And that is the reason why we also call it our definition. Okay, now besides these uh, uh, channels that are there, you can see obviously these channels connecting all those colored in centers, all those defined centers are connected with, through these defined centers. Um, you know, this, this definition as we call it also tells us where is this place of decision making in this particular chart, it's this second box from the bottom, it's the sacral center. And I'll speak a little bit later about generators and why that is, wh what does it mean to, to have a sacral authority? Now, 
What is really interesting is also to look at the openness because the openness in the chart is everything that we see around us everything that we encounter all the people around us all the situations that we're we're part of you know all of that is in our openness and um, the openness really represents potential for really seeing very clearly the world around us it's it's uh it's where we get flooded by information and energies and what is really important for us is to find the, a healthy relationship with our openness because um you know, it can easily take us away from our center. Um, but actually, if we function uh, accordingly to our energy, if we, if we follow our energy, what it gives us is this place of stability, this point of absolute stability where we can totally be secure and, uh, and from where we can meet the world around us. This place of stability uh, is this island of stability uh, in the ocean of life. And the openness is not just these open centers. You know, the openness is also all those gates that are, aren't activated, all those channels that are completely wide. Everything in, that, in this chart is openness. And you can see in this next image that there is actually uh, approximately two thirds of gates uh, open in the chart uh, and only around one third of uh, gates activated in the chart. So there is always way more open, uh, openness in us than the definition. And basically, the main point uh, of this uh, definition versus openness slide is to, is to show you how it is important that we come and meet the world from the place of our stability, from that which is stable within us, which is the definition, you know, these, these energetic connections between two centers. You know, it's, it's the point of stability, and from there we can meet and relate to the world around us, to everything that enters into us through our openness. So that's that's what we're actually making decisions about. You know, we have our uh, personal authority, the the way that we can make our decisions, which is not based on the mind, but is actually based on our energy. And I'll speak a little later about what it means specifically. And this personal authority, this 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 uh, this voice of truth within us, is making decisions about what? Well obviously about all of that which enters into us through our openness okay and that is how we can make really empowered decisions about energies and situations that previously conditioned us how we can remake certain decisions that we made in the past that aren't really serving us and make the right kind of decisions because the openness is obviously a place where we uh, are very susceptible to conditioning uh, once we're disturbed from the natural state of being, uh, where we usually found, find ourselves uh, as children, um, you know, once we're disturbed from that natural state of being, we start to see that all those open areas in our chart uh, seem like a problem. We seem to be missing something there, but it's not broken. It's nothing's missing there. It's really just a potential to see the world around us very clearly. But the problem is that we once we are disturbed from the natural state of being, we no longer follow our energy, but rather we go to the mind and try to figure out the lie from our heads and from the mind, obviously. And that, that leads to creation of certain tendencies, conditioned ways of behavior, which isn't exclusively the realm of open centers, you know, that can happen in the defined centers as well, just as well. But the open centers are more susceptible. The openness is really where we are more susceptible to take on certain ways of behaving and functioning, uh, you know, based on the world around us, based on what our parents taught us, based on what our, the society requires of us, you know. So, so, again, making decisions from our energy, coming from this place of truth within us, from this place of stability within us, and from then, from there, relating to the world around us, to all of that which comes to us through our openness, is allowing us to make correct decisions which take us and enable us to really fulfill our life's potential, to really um, manifest all those gifts and ta talents that we carry, which are, um, you know, um, here in this chart. You can see them here in this chart. Uh, as these uh, rows of numbers on the left and right hand side and uh, 
these gates, you know, these hexagrams, these archetypal gifts and talents that we have, and also these channels which are there. Now, I'm just going to uh, uh, go off the presentation for a little while and just to see how many of you are there. Okay, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I, I'm not really able to follow all those questions. I, I see a question about uh, manifesting generator and generator. What is the difference? I'll get to that when we when I speak about uh, the generator type. Uh, but uh, let's go in order and uh, I'll go back to my presentation. And uh, let's continue. Okay, so you can see those two columns of numbers on the left hand side and on the right hand side of the chart itself you can see these astrological symbols next to them which basically means that these gates these hexagrams these gifts and talents were activated by these specific planets or moon or sun or earth or nodes of the moon now the reason why we have two sets of numbers, which is, by the way, a major difference from astrology, even though we take the same data as astrology. In human design, we interpret these, this data differently. And we also have two sets of data. And the reason why that is, is that Ra was told by the voice that we have two so-called crystals of consciousness. There are two parts of us. There is this design side, this red, uh, red uh, left-hand side of the of the body graph of the chart, with with which all these numbers that are there in red represent the unconscious activations, the form principle, um, you know, the gifts and talents that we have that we're not consciously aware of. It's unconscious, and the reason for that is because it's actually so-called crystal. Of consciousness the design crystal of consciousness which which contains the intelligence of our body and obviously the body is that part of us that we we're just passengers in, in in the vehicle it's this is the vehicle this is the form principle and it's unconscious these gifts and talents are something that yes we live it out for years you know if we you know the longer we live the longer we live it out the you know the more we can experience how it uh, is manifested in our life uh, but um, you know we don't have it uh, in any we don't have any conscious access to it we can just see it in, in in operation as it happens now on the right hand side these uh, numbers uh, in black represent the personality crystal of consciousness it's uh, it's the it's the intelligence of the passenger uh, you can see, uh, or you can say that uh, it's it's the intelligence of our soul. It's that which is eternal. It's that with, with which we really relate. You know, we really, when I say this is me, then this is what we speak about. It's we speak about uh, this row of numbers on the right hand side. Uh, you know, this is something we have conscious access to. This is something that we identify with. This is something that we know about. Now the problem is that. There is, and it's not a problem, obviously, but the, you know, the problem is that there is this whole set of numbers that is in red, which we usually have no idea about, and, and you know, we can be more experienced, and uh, as we uh, grow and age, we know more and more about it, but we have no idea what it's going to do. And therefore, we can really make um, correct decisions for ourselves, because we are really the result of the design and personality together. We are this marriage between uh, the form and the spirit, between the body and the mind. And we cannot make decisions just from our heads, just from our minds. You know, if everything would be black, obviously, in that case, uh, in that case, uh, we wouldn't need any human design because we could be making our decisions directly from our consciousness, being aware of everything that is part of us but we're not we're not aware of that you know when we look at other people and it's interesting to, to just to uh, imagine that when you look at other people you can see both of these parts together you can see their conscious unconscious definition in action you can see them as a whole you know that's why it's so easy to give advice to others 
but uh, but we can really give advice to ourselves that much. You know, a homeopath doesn't cure himself; usually goes to another homeopath. You know, surgeon doesn't operate on on, on himself as well. So this this these crystals of consciousness they really represent this intelligence of the body and the mind and uh, we are result of this marriage between the form and the spirit you know this is this is the the image that goes with that and let me see <clears throat> there is a, uh, there is a question here Um, okay, right, so <clears throat> this was the initial introduction about uh, what is it that we're looking at when you look at the human design body graph, human design mandala, where this all came from and uh, how, how to look at it, what we're looking at really. And now um, I would like to take you to the next part of our uh, uh, introduction of our presentation and uh, that deals with the four types of people and their aura. Um, so, when you look at the chart, you can see this whole set of gifts and talents and, and, and these uh, capacities that we're here to, uh, to express in the world. But one of the things that the chart actually tells us is that based on the different centers that are activated, that are defined, which center is defined, which center is not defined, is open, is undefined, and also uh, which channels are connecting and how these defined centers are connected between one another. Uh, one another. Uh, it determines the way our aura functions, how our energy functions. You know, we know there is this energetic uh, field around us, which is this magnetic energetic field around the human body, and based on the certain configurations in, in your design, based on which centers you have defined and how they're connected together, you, your aura is functioning in one of the four very different ways. And um, these four ways, these four types of aura are so-called four types in human design. They've got their names, again, given by Ra, Ra Uruhu. And you can see uh, in this image that these names are manifester, projector, generator, and a reflector. And each aura is functioning differently and is really uh, giving us an, uh, a window, an access to a completely different reality. Because based on, on the way our aura functions, based on the way our energy functions, we relate to the world in these very, very different four ways, four, uh, four modes of operation. And so let, let me just walk you through these four types. And uh, uh, let's start with this uh, beautiful uh, series of images by Genoa Blevan again, uh, my teacher, and uh, as a way of uh, bringing or explaining you uh, the four different types, uh, let's use uh, the metaphor uh, from uh, again I Ching. We, let's let's uh, let's start with this yin and yang, which is the you know yin is the constructive power and the yang is this creative force. Um, yin and yang is uh, is uh, are are the opposites of one another, and mm, yang represents this super creative. Uh, uh, impulse that brings something new. Yang is this very expansion of energy that comes like a bolt of lightning and brings, creates something new that wasn't here. And you can uh, also see it as this unmanifested con con consciousness, which is not in the world of form, but it's penetrating into the world of form. And the world of form, obviously, is the yin principle where you can see the broken line, so-called broken line, where you can see that as a place where the seed can be planted in the fertile ground. Um, you know, the, the yang comes out of the blue um, as, as this consciousness, that, consciousness that, that enters into the dimension of, of form and brings something new that the yin can embrace. The yin can embrace, take within, and starts to 
build something out of that impulse, the constructive power, yin. Now, if we go further with this metaphor, you can see that by using these diagrams, you know, these two, two lines together, manifester is archetypally the creative force with the yang yang uh, diagram that brings something new that wasn't here before. Uh, while the generator is this constructive power, this really a very yielding uh, type that takes everything into themselves, like like a, like a magnet. You know, the the generator's aura functions like a magnet and and pulls everything towards itself while the manifestor aura functions like a, this very, um, you know, it, like you can see the, the force is going outside from the manifestor, you know, it's a spiral that goes from inside out, and the generator is a spiral that goes from outside in. And it's this yin-yin quality. So there is this um, archetypal, archetypal very yang-yang type, which is manifestors that bring something new that wasn't here before, that initiates something, that starts something new, that have a really big impact on the world around them. And then we have the generator type, who are people, which is almost uh, two-thirds of the people in the world, uh, even more actually, 68% of the people in the world. And they're the people who are here to really take these impulses into themselves. And if their life, or life force really uh, connects with it, so-called response, then they're here to really build something out of that impulse. They're really here to build something. So they're, they're very yielding, they're taking things into themselves, and then they start to generate and build something. It's this constructive power. Now, if we go one step further, you can see this other slide, this next slide, and let's just, okay, there it is, um, where the other two types are actually the types that are like mediators, like in between manifester and generator. Manifester and generator are really the complete opposite of one another energetically. And uh, projector is really the type, you know, you can see on the right hand side, projector is the type that has this uh, yang element to it, but also this yin quality to it. They're able to withstand the, the, the shock, you know, the, the impulse from a manifester and then transition it to, you know, and pass it on to generators in a way that generators can actually take it in. Because sometimes manifestors' impact can be really harsh, can be really uh, uh, very uh, impacting. And, you know, if, uh, if you look at the generator as the, the archetypal representative of the life here, you know, sometimes too much sun or too much water or too much wind can really kill the plant. So, so projectors are here to uh, be the type that manages uh, and facilitates that which is happening and, and can really ideally function in cooperation with generator. You know, if, if we look at the four types from the point of view of what are the natural uh, couples, you know, not, I don't mean partnerships, but what are, uh, in, a, in a romantic sense, but what are between the types, what is the ideal match for each type, then projectors and generators are really a great match, and manifestors and reflectors also are, are, are really a great match together. Projectors are here to bring this impulse down to the ground, that, that's why it says precipitation, it's like when, when it rains, you know, the, the water gets to the ground. And uh, then reflectors are here to see what is happening. And when the time comes, they can lift the whole process up to another level. So while manifestor initiates and impacts the world around uh, itself, and generators are here to really build something based on these impulses that come to them from outside, projectors can be the type that facilitates that which is happening, you know, helps and, and, and facilitates whatever is happening uh, on the level where it is, you know. They can see really well what's going on and they can be really of great help. And reflectors are waiting for something new and something unexpected. And when they see it, they can let manifestors know that, okay, 
it's time to take it up the notch. You know, it's time to lift it up to a new level. It's time that you can initiate something new again. Reflectors, but by their presence, mere presence, uh, can really lift up whatever is happening to the next level. They can connect people that are waking up. They can really recognize what is different, what is unique, and and so uh, that's why it's says evaporation because you know we can look at it as this archetypal circle that. Uh, one is following the other all around again and again and again and obviously this is kind of an idealized uh, uh, way of how the four types can function together and I really love this image from Genoa uh, which explains it so nicely now let's um, let's take a look at these four types uh, individually and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about each of them Okay. All right. So we are looking at a manifestor chart, and manifestors uh, are the people that are really here to impact others. Their aura is closed off and very compact. You know, you can, and it's very dense. You see this spiral that goes out, you know, these, these, points of energy pointing out to the world around them and there is uh, around eight or nine percent manifestors in the world and what makes a manifestor manifestor is the fact that they always have a defined throat center which is the center of manifestation obviously it's the, it's the place you know of communication but also of doing things not just saying but also doing things and basically it's where we manifest anything where we say things where we do things and also, manifestors always have a motor, one of the three motors, uh, connected to that throat. The, the motors can be the ego center, the solar plex center, or the, the root center at the very bottom. <clears throat> In one way or another, they need to connect to the throat continuously. You know, like the root can go through the spleen all the way to the throat. And basically, that means that manifestor has energy because motor gives energy obviously energy that can be manifested expressed straight away that's what makes a manifester manifester that they they can go from zero to 60 miles per hour in in very you know very fast you know in a matter of seconds they're like a cheetah that is chasing a zebra okay they they, they go after zebra the cheetah goes after zebra and if it catches it then then it can eat it and be lying in a shade uh, beneath the tree for the next two weeks or three three weeks and just be lazy and look around and nothing else to do just be you know be at peace and just enjoy the peace you know so manifestors uh, similarly are very fast on short distances they're they're really here to uh, set into motion and go independently out into the world to impact the world around themselves and you know the fact that they're called manifestors because they are here to manifest alone um, you know it doesn't mean that other types don't manifest it's just that other th three types are here to manifest in cooperation with other people manifestors are the only type who are here that are here to manifest in in and of themselves on their own which is kind of a handicap in a way you know it's it's uh they're really here to bring something new into the world. And, and to do that uh, requires a lot of courage. You know, manifestors are already, as children, usually uh, misunderstood in a way that, uh, you know, they're not easily domesticated. You know, they're, you know, you tell them, don't do this, and they keep on doing it as children because, because their aura is really com 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 compact. It's very closed off. It's very dense. And it's like a, a natural defense from anybody uh, uh, who would like to interfere with their process. So they do their own thing and, and you know, can end up also being misunderstood or punished or controlled by the, by the people around them. And as a result, they may end up on their manifesting potential and capacity and actually kind of uh, sit back and kind of wait and see what's happening around and kind of function in response rather than being the, the type that can actually go forth and, and initiate something. And this initiating of something is 
an energy phenomenon. You know, I spoke about the motor being connected to the throat. It's, it's this spark of energy that, that takes manifestor into something, you know, and they need to follow this charge, this spark of energy. It's like if you, you know, there are these uh, jet fighter planes where the pilot presses this button for forsage and there is all of a sudden there is this pull of throttle, you know, and they, they shoot off, you know, in a much faster speed, you know, that's, that's a manifestor's process that all of a sudden something clicks, you know, there is this spark of energy and off they go. Now, obviously they need to do that not because they want to, but again, following their own uh, voice of truth, what we call uh, personal or inner authority, and I'll speak about that later. And if they do that, then they have the, uh, the kind of impact on the world that, that, they, that they really need to. You know, they're here to bring some kind of impact, to impact the world around, them, uh, around themselves, to create some kind of change. And if they do that correctly, then they get to be at peace. If they don't function correctly, if they do that because, you know, somebody wants them to or, or they want it from the mind, you know, they don't follow their energy, uh, if they don't inform others, you know, they meet a lot of resistance and then they don't have the kind of impact that they really need to. And therefore, they may be angry, they may be upset, they may uh, try to uh, work harder and harder and harder instead of being at peace, they become people that are really working very, very hard. And uh, obviously that doesn't give them a lot of peace and calmness in their life and, and usually it ends up really um, them being angry, upset, you know, pissed off about things that are in their way because they really won't get things done. And if something's in their way, which inevitably always is if they don't follow according to their energy, they get to be angry. So there is this uh, common uh, uh, negative feeling, which is the same for all people that are manifestors, which, which is the same for all manifestor uh, type, for the whole manifestor type, which is anger. And there is this what we call signature, which is again, um, something that is the same for all manifestors. It's what manifestor gets when he or she actually follows their energy and informs people around them about what they're going to do. You know, this informing is actually very important for them because, as I said, uh, their aura is closed off, compact. And if, if we meet a manifester, we can't really read him or her that much. You know, when the other three types meet, our auras are more open to one another and we get to read the other person on some kind of a energetic level, even if, the person doesn't know or doesn't believe in energy or chakras or anything, you know, it happens. But once we meet a manifester and we're not a manifester our, ourselves, then it's kind of like we can't really know what they're going to do. You know, even they don't know what they're going to do. They're absolutely unpredictable. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, it really helps if we know what we're dealing with. And for manifestors to inform about what they're going to do, is really the way to remove resistance from their life. If they inform us about what they're going to do, and it's not asking for question, it's not asking for permission. If they inform us, they let us know what they're about to do, and then they go ahead and do it. You know, they don't meet that much resistance. They're actually making uh, the right and um, having the right kind of impact. So, um, yeah, some of the manifestors you may know, Johnny Depp. Um, you know, Robert De Niro, uh, who else? Uh, George W. Bush, <laughs> um, uh, Vladimir Putin also. Um, okay, let's go to the next type. And obviously this was very brief uh, introduction to the subject of manifestors. Um, you know, if we, if you participate in the Living Your Design course, we will dedicate uh, an entire class just to manifestors and speak about it much longer and we'll have a chance to share. Um, the same for other types, obviously. And here we're looking at the generator type. Now, I believe that most of you that are here are generators simply because statistically, 68% uh, of population are generators. I'm a generator myself. And here you can see this invert pointing spiral that I was mentioning where the generator's aura really takes things very deeply into itself. Um, 
at the very core of our being, of our generator being, is this life force which resides in the sacral center, which is the second box from the bottom, the red box. Um, this is the place where life force and life's energy and sexual energy resides, and it's the fourth motor, the strongest of all. Now, everybody who has this center defined, meaning that the center is connected by a channel to another center, and therefore it's red, is a generator, belongs to a generator type, including manifesting generators, and I'll clarify that a little later. But manifesting generators have generator aura, they're generators just like the pure generators, but have a slightly different process. But they need to respond as well. We all, all generators, I'm a manifesting generator myself, we all need to respond. And what does it mean to respond? Because you can hear these words very often you know, in connection with uh, the types, you know, to wait for invitation, to respond. Uh, these are the, the keywords, the keynotes that go with these types. But at the same time, it can be kind of confusing and it usually takes a while for the person to really figure out what it means. It took me several months, literally, of having absolutely no idea what it means to respond until I started to get it. Now, based on my own experience and based on you know me trying to explain it uh, to others in readings, in courses, um, I've... Um, I've come to a way of describing what, what the response means um, in a way that I believe helps people to get it faster than I got it, you know. But uh, nevertheless, it's a process that uh, we all have to go through, you know. We are told these things uh, by words. Our mind can understand it, but it speaks about energetic reality and its energy. It's not the head. It's not the mind. We, we need to tune into it in our energy. So... Response is just a word, but it, what it actually is, is this rising up of our life force. And, and this is very important to, re, to remember. Uh, I would like to emphasize that because many times I get people asking me, well, is this response, is that response? And it's not about being logical about it. It's about really, well, do you feel the life force rising up? Do you feel more life in you? Are you satisfied when you connect with that, when you do that, when you work? on that project, when you are in this relationship or when you work on that project, is there satisfaction? This rising up in the life force is actually similar to if you have a seed and you put it on, the de on a desert, it doesn't grow, but if you put it in a, in a water or if you put it in a, in a moist soil and water it, it sprouts and then it starts to grow. You know, when, when our sacral responds to something that it wants to respond to, then the, 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 the life force rises, okay? There is more energy. It, we can never decide from our mind, just like we can decide from our, from our mind to fall in love or to unfall in love, from, you know, to fall out of love. But it, it happens naturally, just like life evolves, you know? And so, for example, you may be walking on the street and you see a billboard for a movie and you've seen maybe three other billboards that day and nothing happened. And then you see this particular one, and you go like, oh, yes, I want to go there. I want to see this movie. And in that moment, if it's something that is really significant, if it's uh, something that you can really uh, feel as a really strong response, you know, you can, you can really tune into what it means. You know, it, it can be maybe if you watch a, watch a, 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 you know, a, a sport play and your team scores a goal, or, you know, if you see an old friend that you didn't see for a while and you meet them on the street and you go, Hi, George, and cross the street, you know. So uh, when something like that happens where it's really obvious for you that this life force is rising up, there is more life in you, you become more alive, it's something that you can learn to tune into in other instances in your daily life where the response isn't that powerful, isn't that strong. You know, it can be very subtle. Would you like a tea? Mm, yeah, yeah, I'd like, you know, I can have a tea. Now... Uh, once you learn this feeling of rising up of your life force, of your life's energy, once you tune into that, you begin to recognize it more and more, and you can follow it. And if you follow it, that means that whatever it is you're doing, you've got the energy for it. You have the energy for whatever it is you're doing once you act out of response. This is what we call response. Okay, now you can also see many times when it comes to generator that people say, okay, sacral authority basically means you're here to make sounds. Uh-huh, mm-mm. 
Now, it's true that sounds can be helpful. If uh, I have a sacral authority, for example, that means I don't have a defined solar plexus, emotional center. Uh, somebody asks me a yes or no question, I can go, uh-huh, mm, mm, mm And this uh, sound that happens immediately after the question, there should be no pause, no break between the question and the sound. If it happens immediately after the question, then this sound is again another way of tuning into this rising up of our life force because it goes, uh-huh, mm, mm, up, or mm, I don't know, or uh, uh, it goes down. Okay, but it's just a useful tool. No need to overemphasize that sacred authority means, you know, making these sounds on every step of your way. Um, I, you know, I use them, especially when I choose my food, when I go to a restaurant with a group with, with my partner and I, I ask her to help me, you know, to ask me some questions about what is it I want. If I'm there alone as well, I look at the menu and I go, I go like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, it helps me. But, you know, I don't really often use that besides restaurants. So it's not like you need to be making these sounds all the time. And I just, I'm um, just, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I, I feel that it's actually overemphasized, this, this sacred sound business. But uh, really it's about response. It's really about tuning into your life force and being able to follow it as it rises up. And, you know, the more you do that, the, the easier it gets and the easier you're able to recognize that. Now, the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I see this uh, different questions like what is the difference between emotional projector and mental projector and, and so on. Uh, I won't have at all a chance to speak about that. This is really, you know, a general introduction to human design and it's going to take uh, about an hour and 40 minutes anyways. Uh, these are really very nuanced questions, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, I can go, I can, I can answer this one. Uh, manifestors are really uh, lonely uh, wolves. You know, their, their aura is really separating them from others and it's a really challenge for them to go into action and to be connected with others when their uh, spark of energy, their, their impulse takes them into action and then they need to withdraw again. It's not about them being lonely, but it's just that they're not really... Uh, usually the people that are always connected with others. And um, yeah, that's just uh, about what I can say about that now. Uh, again, more details and, and, you know, looking at your personal, your own charts and all that is something that we can do in the Loving Your Design course, which begins on April 7th. Okay, now back to generators. Uh, if they follow, the, if, if, if we follow our uh, energy, if we follow our response, if we follow our life force, we get to build the world that satisfies us. You know, we're really here to build, you know, we're the builders of this world. We are the people that build uh, and, and create this, uh, this Maya, you know, we're, we're, we are archetypally the form principle, you know, uh, archetypally, obviously when, when for example, a in, a, in a chart of a manifestor in, this, in these diagrams, it's of the creative uh, force, it doesn't mean that manifestors are the only people that are creative. They're just archetypal representatives, representatives of the, of the creative force. In the same way that generators are archetypal representatives of this constructive power of this world of form, actually. So we get to be satisfied, which is the signature of generators, if we follow our response. If we make our decisions from the mind, we usually initiate, that's what we call, you know, this is this term that we use to initiate, is to be acting not based on the rising up of the life force, but actually from the mind. Instead of following the energy, we force it into where we think it should go. And then obviously we meet the resistance and uh, we get stuck or, or frustrated or angry and and you know this is also a place where I can speak about the difference between pure generators and manifesting generators uh, you know it's always a generator right it's generator aura so we all need to respond but pure generators are generators that are here to go very thoroughly one step at a time from A to B to C to D and so on all the way to Z Whereas manifesting generators are here to, uh, once they respond, do a whole series of jumps forward, skipping steps that aren't important, 
and really be very quick. <laughs> that also makes them the archetypal type, archetypal representatives of people that are missing things that are really important. <laughs> because we just skip some things that are actually important and sometimes we need to go back to that. And, uh, you know, we're, um, you know, manifesting generators are really very uh, quick. And that is also the reason why it's even more difficult for manifesting generator to give up initiating all the time. Because there is this uh, manifesting capacity. There is a motor connected to the throat, be it whatever motor it can be, you know, sacrum or, or whatever other um, of the, you know, there are four motors. So... So it, it's more difficult for manifesting generator to give up initiating and start responding. But um, yeah, you know, if, if that happens, it's it's a process. Obviously, you know, it's it's a process. Once you get to know your design, if once you get your reading or once you participate in the living your design course, it really helps to, you know, ground it in your in your everyday life to take a course like that. This this foundational course of human design. Once you go through that experience. Uh, then it's up to you and um, and your determination. You know, I, I like uh, I like to uh, say sometimes to clients that maybe you can do these uh, half a day or or one day workshops where you decide, okay, for this next day, this whole day, I'm just going to respond. And I remember how terrified I was at the beginning, you know, when I was new to human design ten years ago, where I thought, well. You know, I'm really scared if I if I imagine to really completely give up making decisions from our mind. I, I just feel really scared. It's 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 really scary. And then I, I was at a uh, I was in Croatia by by the Mediterranean Sea for holidays, and I was there with my girlfriend, and and we were we decided, okay, today we're just going to respond. And I remember how all day it just everything turned out beautifully, but at the same time there was this irritation in me that I couldn't just do things from the mind, I had to respond, you know, it's, it's always a process. Um, so I already spoke about the signature of generators, which is uh, satisfaction. What is the not self uh, manifestation of generators? Uh, if they don't respond, if they initiate, we get to be frustrated. It's this, uh, you know, it's this great power and energy that wants to build something you know beautiful in the world and and it's like if you are if you if you buy a new car and you get stuck in a traffic you know because you decide to go somewhere where you shouldn't be going you know if you make your decisions from the mind you, you get stuck or or you skip certain things that are really important and and and, and uh, you build a skyscraper and then you have to tear it down and <laughs> and you know the life can chase you like a Bucks of rocks on the wheels down the hill because you you were just way too fast. So, so this feeling of frustration is this negative uh, feeling the generators can feel if they don't follow their energy, if they don't follow their response. And in the pure generator, it can also be the feeling of being stuck. And the manifesting generator, it can also be the feeling of being angry. You know, because there is this manifesting capacity, so manifestors can get angry if they don't. Uh, follow their designs. Uh, manifesting generator can be either frustrated or angry or both. <laughs> it's a beautiful combination, I can tell you. Um, and yet, we can be really just, just really powerful beings, really powerful beings that are absolutely satisfied with the world that we build. And we build our own world. And obviously, even if you're in a job that you know you don't like, for example, and this goes for all the four types, you know, everybody. Uh, if you follow your design as much as you can, the circumstances of your life, uh, uh, you know, over time change, and and you know, it just starts to work out for you. Either it you know it changes to a point where you actually begin to enjoy and be satisfied there, or you find a new uh, or you find a new work. Okay, um, all right. Um, Let's look at the projectors. It's the next type uh, uh, that I have in this order, actually. Obviously, the order doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, all four types are significant and needed and important, and, uh, and otherwise they, they wouldn't be here, obviously. And projectors are the type that uh, is here to guide other people. They're the first of the non-energy types, so-called non-energy types. We have two energy types, you know, as the manifester and generator. 
And they both have something in common because there is this source of energy, either sacral center or the, the energy di directly connected to the throat, which allows them to do something with their energy, you know, to build something or to impact and initiate, okay? And just like generator is following the rising up of the, of the sacral energy, the manifester is following the spark of energy and informs. Okay, now the, the two other types, uh, projectors and reflectors, are so called non energy types. And uh, so, hello to all of you projectors here. And um, projectors are beings that are very open to the world around them. And they're, you could say, they're looking at, the, at, the, at life from outside. Why is that? Well, because they don't have a defined sacred center. The second box from the bottom is always undefined, open. Otherwise, they would be a generator. So they're looking at the life from outside, manifestors as well, you know, and, and ref, ref, uh, reflectors as well. But projectors are not just here to look at the life from outside. You know, manifestors look at it and they initiate. But, uh, uh, and then they look at what happened when they initiated, how they impacted the world around them. But projectors are here to really take other people deeply into themselves. Their aura is very focused and penetrating. And they can approach other person and their aura, aura really goes deeply into the other person's energy. And it absorbs, it takes in a lot of energy and information. Okay? And when that happens, um, they can some of that they perceive on a conscious level so they can see a lot of things about that person possibly some of it they don't even notice at the moment when it's happening but it goes in in, in them anyways and so they take the other person in very deeply and they can see some things that can be very helpful now the main point is that they're here to guide only when invited and the invitation again is just a keyword that obviously, inevitably, is going to be misunderstood by a projector who is new to human design. Because, uh, you know, what we imagine to be an invitation in the normal sense is not necessarily the invitation that is the invitation that projector can, can be invited with. Um, let me explain that. The invitation, as I see it, is a set of energetic circumstances. It's not that somebody comes to you and invites you and says, Oh, dear Mark, could you please help me with this? Yes, that's obviously a wonderful invitation, uh, even more so if it's sincere, but the invitation is the set of energetic circumstances that actually allows projector to manifest and express their gifts and talents in a way that other people can see. Okay, you know, I remember I said that all, all four types are here to to be able to come into manifestation. It's just that manifestors are the only type that can do it on, them, on, the, on their own. The other three types have to do that in cooperation with other people. And so the thing that projectors don't have in their chart, and it's not that they miss it, because, because the reason they, they're able to guide and facilitate is because exactly because they're not, they're not manifestors, they're not generators, but they don't have a motor connected to a throat and they don't have a sacral center defined. So what does it mean? Obviously, they need energy. They need access to energy. And that invitation is really uh, uh, an energetic circumstances that gives them access, that give them access to energy and allows them to express themselves in a way that people see them, people hear them, and what they say actually matters, what they say actually uh, facilitates whatever is happening around them. So, so you know, if you look at it mechanically, if, if you look at the this image on the left-hand side of the slide where you see all these centers defined at the, at the bottom, and um, I hear a message that says lost audio, but I hope it's just for you, uh, Judith, and everybody else can hear me. Uh, let me just check. Let's just check, do a little check. Okay, I can hear the audio button. Button is is uh, functioning. I I believe that uh, everyone else is actually hearing me 
and hopefully you too. So if you look at this uh, left-hand side of, the, of this image, you can see this projector uh, chart uh, with all these red channels. And, uh, you know, there are energy centers there. There is ego, there is a, there is a solar plexus, there is a root. But, but this energy needs to get to the throat to be expressed. Obviously, that, uh, that is something that someone else brings, you know. And through invitation, uh, which hopefully is based on certain recognition of the other person, uh, that, uh, okay, they recognize that you as a projector can really give them something, can really offer them something. Through this invitation, you're able to express whatever are your gifts and talents. I mean, this isn't a really uh, a real projector chart. It's just a, it's just, just a symbolic uh, archetypal uh, drawing. Okay, so <clears throat> the invitation unlocks the key to projector success. Projectors are really here to be successful. That is their signature, success. And the success for projectors really means that they're seen, heard, recognized, appreciated, and that when they guide other people, when they share with them something, when they ask them questions, they actually enable, uh, 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 they actually facilitate whatever is happening. They bring something uh, that is very helpful. To the world around them. Now, projectors are system analysts. They're the eternal students. They really are looking at life from outside and they really want to understand life. And um, usually they, they see a lot of things, but they, they need to practice to be the detached observer. They need to practice to be looking with, uh, uh, with just, just looking and appreciating the people around them. Um, it's, it's a very uh, simple spiritual truth that if you want something, you should give it. And for projectors that are really, you know, wanting to be recognized and seen and appreciated, this is what they need to do. They need to actually really look at other people and really deeply recognize them and appreciate them without interfering with their process. And if they can, if they can do that and... Um, if they can wait for the invitation, if they can take their time and wait for the invitation, then uh, they will be recognized and they will be invited. You know, it's this invitation is like this invisible door uh, uh, that opens a space for them in the energy of the situation that they're in, for them to be able to say something and to do something in a way that other people recognize, other people can hear, other people can see. And if they're just way too fast, if they're giving unsolicited advice, if they try to guide other people, if they try to invite other people, um, you know, if they're not waiting for the invitation, basically, what happens is that they're not seen, they're not heard, nobody wants to listen to them. And uh, they get, you know, these uncomfortable feelings of being uh, unrecognized, you know, these feelings of being bitter, you know, and that is the negative feeling of projectors that, when they don't follow their energy, when they don't live according to their design, is that they feel bitter. And so, um, you know, this, uh, this bitterness is something that uh, can be very, very strong in some projectors, uh, especially if they don't live according to their design for years. You know, the older they are, they can be bitter. And you have to be very careful about not letting this bitterness out into the world because, uh, if you do that, then there is even less chance that you'll be recognized and invited. And really, for all of us, it's about uh, giving up the life that we thought uh, we have or giving up the, the way we thought we should live our lives and being open to what the life actually brings. And what is really interesting uh, for me to observe is that if I give up, uh, you know, these uh, ideas about how things should be, you know, things evolve differently, but I'm more satisfied. The same goes for, for projectors. They get to be successful on much larger scale uh, than they would ever imagine if they stop trying to attract attention and just wait for the invitation. And obviously, it's not an easy task uh, for a projector. You know, it's like uh, seeing a, a waiter who is carrying a soup in a restaurant and is spilling the soup on his shoulder and not saying anything. <laughs> 
sometimes that can feel like that, you know. And projectors are archetypally here to be first, and therefore they need they need to wait for the other three types to catch up. You know, they have a lot of awareness under pressure to express it, but they really need to be this detached observer and wait for invitation, recognize others, and then the invitation come, and they can guide and facilitate and be successful at that. All right, that's it for projectors. And let's move to our reflector. And uh, just very briefly, there aren't that many reflectors. Uh, um, maybe there aren't re any reflectors in, in this uh, part participating in this broadcast even. If there are, it's beautiful, welcome. Uh, reflectors are the type that has all the nine centers open, therefore all nine centers function in harmony, in sync, because there is no polarity, no, no, no duality between definition and openness. All centers are open. And therefore, because of that, they can perceive when they meet other people, if they're in harmony, if they're, uh, if they're in energetic harmony, you know, if their nine centers in their aura are, is, are in harmony with one another. And they can see and really sample who the other person is, who other people are. And, and through their aura, they're bringing certain celestial energies. They're bringing certain qualities of transits that are here, that are influencing actually the whole world. But through their aura, they're bringing it out into the world. And that's, that's how they offer these uh, potentials and enable the whole situation to be lifted up to another level. Their aura is really open and when, when they meet you they feel very differently from when they meet someone else but once they walk away from you it just drops off their aura. That's why their aura is also this resistant Teflon aura where they sample and reflect what they, what they're, you know, whoever they're interacting with, but then it goes away, it doesn't stick to them, actually. And their process of decision-making is very unique and very uh, much tied to the cycle of the moon. And I'll speak about that a little later when we get to the uh, inner authorities, to the, to the personal authorities section. So basically, um, reflectors can see who is unique, who is different, because through this open aura they can see what is different from the from 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 everything else and they can be pleasantly surprised exhilarated about something and or <laughs> if then if they function uh, you know incorrectly if they make their decisions from the mind they can be very disappointed by the world around them and one of the most important things is really for them to be in a healthy environment because they have an open G center, this diamond in the middle. And, uh, you know, everybody who with an open G center is very sensitive to their environment and to the people they're with because they really de determine their momentarily in identity, you know, how they feel, uh, you know, so they're very influenced by people around them, by the, by the environment around them, and they, they really need to be careful about being with the people and in the places where they really like it, where they, you know, then they'll be healthy, and, you know, then things will just work out for them. They, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting how once Reflector gets to the right environment, you know, things just flow, and, you know, it's just happening for them. They're in the zone. But it's you know it's really important to be in the place where 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 they feel good, where they like the place, you know, the the office they work or the house they live in, or obviously the partner or the colleague colleague at work. So to close this section of our uh, presentation about four types, you can see this chart which <clears throat> outlines each type. You can see that uh, manifester has a strategy to inform and strategy is the word that I haven't used so far. Uh, I believe strategy is a really this ideal way of functioning and it's based on our aura, on the quality of our aura. And manifester is here to inform and really is on the quest to see how they impact other people. You know, if they uh, really go forth and initiate based on their spark of energy and their, uh, their voice of truth, they get to be at peace. If not, they get to be angry. Generators are here to respond, which is this rising up of the life force, this rising up in the energy. And through response, they get to experience and know who they actually are. And they get to be satisfied 
And if they make their decisions uh, from the mind, if they don't respond, you know, they get to be frustrated, also could feel stuck or angry in case of manifesting generators. <clears throat> Projectors are here to wait for the invitation and they're, they are really here to, to see deeply and recognize deeply the other person. They're here to be successful, which for them means to be recognized and to be able to facilitate whatever is happening. You know, one of the best ways for projectors to, to guide is uh, guiding by asking questions. It's not like a major in, in the military, you know, to order something, to, to give orders, but to, to really guide, to be a guide, uh, and to be successful guide. Otherwise, they get to be bitter because they, they know a lot of things and they really are here to help, and if they try to help, uh, just way too fast. If they, if they don't wait for the invitation, they get to be bitter because they, they will be rejected. They won't be recognized. Um, and a reflector is really here to wait for a lunar cycle as a st strategy to make any kind of really significant decision in their life. Also, they like to be alone or in the company of children because, as I spoke about them, they are very much influenced by the identity of the people they meet and children that are in that condition obviously as adults are are uh, you know they like to be amongst children or in nature and they can see who other people are they can be moving between whole groups of people and bring certain quality that that shifts whatever is happening to the next level and um, they get to be pleasantly surprised exhilarated because they they see something new something different or they get to be disappointed if they make their decisions from the mind. And obviously it's a very distracting for a reflector not to know that they're a reflector because their experience of themselves is changing so much really based on who they meet. So, yeah, that is the conclusion of this section. And we're going to go uh, briefly to the subject of the nine energy centers. And then we'll go to the subject of uh, personal authority. And so let me just take a sip of water. Okay. So you can see these nine energy centers and uh, each of them has a different color. Uh, by the way, the voice didn't explain the colors, but it just assigned the colors, just like it, it told Ra which gates are in which centers and how they're connected. And you can see that there are nine centers, and that uh, um, each center is really uh, related to a different theme of our life. I already spoke about these centers being certain organs of perception, and... Uh, let me see. I'm reading a question here. Yeah, somebody says projectors are potentially most conditioned because of not only their open sections, but because they have so deeply focused on the other <clears throat> and because they've, they're not uh, aware of conditioning energy coming in. Yeah, that's true, but um, I, I disagree that they're the most conditioned. I, I don't think we can stereotype it and just, uh, you know, say these generalized uh, uh, statements about, okay, projectors must be the most conditioned uh, type. I don't think so. It's really, there could be a person that is the most conditioned person. It doesn't have to be a projector. But it's true that they might not be aware of uh, all the things that are going, taking, that they're taking in into themselves energetically. Again, we only have a brief uh, uh, time for each center. You know, in the Living Your Design course, we're going to go in, in much deeper. And I might actually do uh, separate presentations for different types. Uh, you know, that's going to be a, <coughs> uh, announced through Human Design America uh, classes. But uh, that's that's what I had to say about projections. I, you know, I didn't get to say this. I, I... All right, so... You can see these, uh, and in the meanwhile, while I was talking, you could uh, take a look at the, this uh, image and see all these different areas uh, that each center is related to. Now, uh, let me just remind you of the principle. Uh, when the center is defined, you have a fixed way of functioning and relating to that area of the chart. For example, ego center is about material world and provisions 
and willpower and value and so forth. And when the ego center is defined, what happens is that you, um, okay, let me go to the next slide. Let me just skip. When the ego center is defined, uh, you have a fixed way of, uh, oops, okay, many different slides there. Okay, finally, this is going to be one. This is the one. <laughs> this is Unio. Okay, the willpower. If you have it defined, then uh, you have your fixed way of expressing willpower, of, of, assert, of asserting yourself, of making uh, money or, or being in control, of providing for yourself materially in this world of, uh, you know, that we live in. We live in the material world. And to have this ego center defined means you have a fixed way of dealing with that reality. But if you have it undefined, that means you, you need to find a healthy relationship with these themes. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by following the strategy of your type, which, for example, in the case of projector, is waiting for the invitation. And when the invitation comes, your voice of truth, your inner authority, decides if you should accept or reject the invitation. And, and you know, one of the things uh, that go along with it is that if you should accept it, it means it's going to be valuable for you. If you if you should reject the invitation, it means it will not it would not be valuable for you. You cannot know from the mind if you have an open ego center. You cannot know from the mind if something is of value for you. But your voice of truth will tell you if it's valuable to you or not. And so, in different uh, times, in different situations, different things will be valuable for you or will not be valuable for you. You don't have a fixed way of relating to this, to, the, to, to this reality. And you can find this way of relating to it through following your energy, your strategy and authority, your, your way of decision making. Now, let me just go back a little bit. <clears throat> I skip forward as a, uh, as a good manifesting generator example. Uh, this is a slide which speaks about the different biological correlations of each center. They're, they're responsible for certain organs or functions in the body. Again, if, you look, if, you look, if you're watching this from the recording, you can pause it and you can uh, take a look at it uh, longer. Um, you know, there are many, many things that obviously can be said about centers. Uh, there are two pressure centers, head and the root. There are three centers of awareness through which we are becoming aware of something. You know, in the spleen, it's through instincts and intuition. In the ajna, it's through mental concepts. And in the solar plexus, it's through feelings. And there are these four motors, which I spoke about already. You see the root, sacral, ego, and solar plexus. Obviously, G-center is the center of uh, identity. Throat is the center of manifestation. Sacred center is the center of life force and sexual energy. We spoke about it being very powerful and how it engages in response. It's about fertility, sexuality. Um, you know, uh, if you have it open, you really need to find your healthy relationship with the theme of life force. You know, uh, archetypally, generators are the most powerful type. I mean, of course, there could be somebody uh, who is tired and, and exhausted and sick and could be a ge generator, and then next to him could be a healthy pr projector who seems to have a way more energy and, and, and maybe even has. But, but every projector or manifester or reflector need, needs to find a healthy relationship with the theme of this uh, uh, life force because they're taking this life force in from all those generators around and they can be very charged supercharged with this life force and they they can work way too much way more than they should actually as a result of that if they're not careful if they're not following their uh, energy and this way of making decisions based on their design on your design on your energy is a protection from not getting exhausted not uh I'm not working just way too much. Okay. Let's see. You can see the slide with the different uh, uh, gates in the sacred center. It's just to show you a little bit deeper, you know, uh, what we're looking at. Each gate is the th has a theme of power for something. For example, uh, 29th gate is the power to say yes and to commit. 
Ninth gate is the power to focus the energy. Um, you know, the fifth gate is the power to wait. And depending on these activations, which you actually have in your chart, whether your sacral center is defined or undefined, you do have the power for these things if you function according to your design. And everything we say about each center is really coming from the keynotes, from these gates, from these hexagrams, and possibly also the channels that are connecting these two centers. Like, for example, 515, you know, the 5 is in the sacral center, and uh, 15 is in the G above. You cannot see it here. And it's the channel of rhythm, you know. So fifth gate is the power to wait and keep the fixed rhythm. And um, ego center we spoke about, and this is what happens uh, if we don't find a healthy relationship with the world of ego, with the world with the world of uh, willpower. And and uh, obviously, uh, as I said already, the open centers are a bit more susceptible to conditioning. They can be easier conditioned than the defined centers, but the defined centers can be conditioned just as well. So when you look at these not so themes of the, the ego center, which is trying to prove to be better, to be as good as, or to be better than, than the other person. Um, you know, it's not the domain exclusively of the open ego center. You know, it can totally happen for somebody with a defined ego center as well. You know? And uh, by the way, almost two thirds of the people in the world uh, have an open ego center. You know, so there is nothing wrong with having a private jet and nothing wrong with exercising, but if you do it just to be better or to prove that you're better, obviously something's wrong. So I hope you are having fun with this collage as I did when I was putting it together. I'm just going to skip through these other uh, centers uh, very quickly. Um, not even probably as I see it saying much. Um, and the reason is that we've taken a longer time than I anticipated uh, on the types. And anyways, you can read about these centers, obviously, also online. You can look at uh, my website. You can look at other resources. You can buy books from Human Design America. They have a wonderful web store. Um, so let's uh, go to the last center that i want to talk about and, and the reason for that is also that it's going to be the first example of so-called inner authority and so let's look at the solar plex center and everybody who's who's got it defined knows that they're riding this emotional wave up and down up and down uh you know the keynotes that again are coming from the specific gates in the solar plexus are feelings moods passions desire, intimacy, sensitivity, social awareness, relational intelligence, involvement, and nervousness. And, you know, if you have, a, if you have this center defined, uh, you're riding on this wave up and down, up and down. I'll speak about it in a little moment. If you have it open, you are open to uh, emotions of other people. Um, I know that very well from my own experience. Uh, you know, we are amplifying the emotions of others. You know, we can feel them, uh, you know, stronger than the people who, that are emotionally defined. And, and we, we amplify these feelings. You know, somebody next to us is, is high on their emotional wave and we can feel it like in heaven or very happy, very blissful, you know, very joyful. And, and the person is down on the emotional wave and we can really experience this depth of despair and and really dark, dark feelings. So because we amplify it and we're very sensitive to it. And obviously, if you have an open solar plexus, if it's white, undefined, again, we need to find a healthy relationship with this openness. And we do that by relating to it from our definition, from that place within us, which is really solid, where our personal authority, where our voice of truth resides. You know, so um, for example, as a, as a generator, you know, if I meet a situation where uh, I feel certain emotions and feelings, I'm not here to make decisions based on how I feel on the emotional level. If it's, if it's beautiful and nice feelings or if these are difficult feelings, that's not how I should make my decisions. It's, it's about, well, do I really respond? Meaning, did I really, did my life force really deeply connected with that situation? for me to really say yes to it and be committed and be involved in that process, whether I like the feelings that I'm experiencing or not. 
that's the key issue here. Obviously, when we have a, uh, an open solar plexus, we may have a tendency to avoid uh, certain confrontations, to avoid uncomfortable truths, or try to smile at others and just, you know, pretend that, you know, that's okay, no problem, I'll do whatever you want me to do, just so we don't get into argument and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's the not self, you know, each, each of these centers have its own not self theme, and, you know, as I said, it's not the domain exclusively of the center which is open, undefined. But it can also go for the center which is defined. Only in the case of solar plexus, kind of an exception, people that are defined solar plexus, they may also uh, dislike a confrontation, for example, some of them, but they just naturally move towards the confrontation if, if, if it's there in the situation. Whereas people with an open solar plexus tend to move away from confrontation. Again, these are just interpretations, uh, just certain uh, side notes that I'm giving you. Uh, you know, we need to find our own relationship with these themes. Uh, if you have a good reading from a, from a professional, or you know, if you get a, if you sign up for the Living Your Design course and go through that, you know, we're spending uh, a lot of time on each center. We're 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 sharing about it. You know, there are body groups that meet uh, between each lesson, you know, groups of two or three students that are sharing together their experiences. And we're, we're working with very creative techniques to go very deep uh, in this, in each center, you know, in, in our design. Anyways, we're coming uh, slowly towards the end. Uh, not really yet, but slowly. And the last subject that I'd like to introduce to you uh, is the subject of personal authority, which is about being aligned with our energy. It's this voice of truth within us that, we, that tells us what to do, whether to accept something or reject it, whether to go somewhere or not. And the term personal authority uh, is coined by Genoa because uh, you can usually hear the term inner authority, which means there is a specific center energetic center, which is center of decision-making in the chart. But then if you print out the, uh, you know, the chart from MMI software, from Jovian, um, and you are a mental projector or a reflector, it says inner authority, none. And so it's kind of uh, um, confusing, I think. Uh, these people, it doesn't mean that they have no way of making their, uh, their decisions. Uh, personally, it's just that uh, they don't have a center which is responsible for this decision making, and their decision making is uh, rather unique and, and uh, needs to be, you know, described uh, slightly differently. But they also have their own voice of truth. Therefore, uh, the term personal authority, which applies to all modes of authorities, including reflector and mental projector. You can see in this uh, image, uh, you know, except for a reflector, uh, all the other uh, modes of authority, which begins with mental projectors, then we go to self-projected uh, um, uh, inner authority, ego inner authority, splenic, sacral, and solar plex inner authority. Um, there is a certain progression where uh, any, t any chart, any design, it doesn't matter if it's a generator, projector, or a manifester, if it has a solar plexus defined on the right hand, right bottom side, on the bottom right is the solar plexus inner authority, then they always have inner authority, emotional solar plexus inner authority. It's about waiting for emotional clarity. It doesn't matter what type it is, you know, it doesn't matter what other centers are defined. You can see in this case it's a it's a generator with spleen and solar plexus defined. It still has solar plexus inner authority. If it doesn't have a solar plexus inner authority and there is a sacral uh, definition, then it's a sacral inner authority. If there is only spleen, you know, uh, down there defined, then it's a splenic inner authority. If there isn't even a spleen, then it's an ego, if there is ego, or the G center as a self projected inner authority, which is only the case of projectors, you know. But the ego and the splenic inner authority can be projectors or manifestors. And then again, uh, personal authority of mental projectors. Now, let's take a look uh, as an example, just one example. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, of, this, of this 
most common inner authority, most common way of decision making, which is the emotional inner authority. Its keynotes are emotional clarity, which actually translates and is, I believe, a little more understandable to others as to clearly feel. Okay, so your truth is not what you think, what you think, your truth is what you clearly feel. Okay, that which you clearly feel is your truth. And to be able to clearly feel something, you need to wait. You need to wait for your cycle. Because as an emotional being, you're moving up and down on this emotional wave. And you're looking at your decision from all points of this emotional wave. And, you know, there is this movement between joy and sorrow, this pleasure and pain, hope and despair. And, and, and every time, you, you know, it, it changes all the time. Your feelings are changing all the time. So this emotional clarity is not what you feel right now, because you're always feeling something right now, especially if you're emotionally defined. But it's actually what you feel over time when you take your time and arrive at a place of emotional clarity where all of a sudden you realize, I feel it clearly enough. It's clear enough for me to be able to make the decision. And this is accompanied with this, ah, this relief, this, you know, this uh, relief, the nervousness goes away, something falls into place, and then you're clear. And until you're clear, you're not clear, so it's better for you to take your time. It's better to be hard to get, to take your time, to even, you know, somebody calls you and says, how oh, would you like to go out with me tonight? And it's better for you to say, well, let me get back to you at 3, three in the afternoon. I'll, I'll get back to you and, or 5 p.m. and oh, let's just see, you know. Or at least give me five minutes, I'll call you back if it's something rather urgent, you know. So take your time to be able to feel, to tune into your feelings. You know, one of the things that can help you is if somebody asks you, well, how do you feel about it? Well, how do you feel about it? What do you feel? That's really your truth, what you're clearly feeling. And, you know, it takes a courage to go on this emotional wave, takes courage to go to the bottom of it. Um, you're meeting a lot of unprocessed emotions that got stuck there in, in, in your earlier life. And if you can just go through it without trying to change whatever it is you're feeling, you're feeling, but just being with it, feeling it, and going through it, and that can bring a lot of relief for you. And and it's like kind of a therapy that you need no therapist for. It's just it takes courage. And and this 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 move on, movement on this emotional wave up and down is, you know, you may be even going deeper or higher. If if you allow yourself to go deeper, you're gonna go higher, but it's not gonna be so difficult. Or it's just going to be easier and easier the more you're able to face the bottom of your emotional wave the higher you will go and, and these unprocessed emotions will clear up eventually so the wait for emotional clarity to clearly feel is is something that really is correct for half of the people in the world you know and they're 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 not here to make spontaneous decisions fast decisions they're really here to take their time and, you know, if they just knew this very simple tip, you know, I told this to my grandfather who was like 78 and he said, oh, my dear boy, if, it, if, if you would have told me that when I was 20, I could have had such a wonderful life. <laughs> All right, we spoke about sacral inner authority, which is about responding, you know, the rising up of the life force. It's about this deeply connecting with something that comes from outside and building something as a result of that. Uh, the last uh, one is uh, that I know I want to mention is uh, splenic inner authority. It's you know in this case is a chart of a manifester. This is Genoa's chart, uh, but it also could be a splenic authority in a projector. It's really about going with the first thing that comes. It's this immediate awareness, which is about okay. It's faster than mind. It's faster than than thoughts. It's faster than any emotions. It's just what you are aware of immediately. And if you follow it, you'll not only be, you know, at peace or successful as a projector or manifester, but uh, you'll also be healthy because it's about health. And if you don't follow it, you know, you may, it, it may have big consequences for your health. You know, your instincts and intuition are here to be followed. <laughs> and reflectors has a, have a very mysterious process. They're really here to wait for the lunar cycle and, and, to really listen to themselves in conversation with others uh, when they make their decisions. Obviously, it's got to be something big. 
no need to wait for a lunar cycle if it's about choosing your lunch. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, when it comes to really big decisions, you know, I'm 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 not gonna go further into that. There is a whole lot of things that I could speak about uh, with with regards to to this mode of authority, but we don't have time for that. So and kind of kind of coming to a close here, uh, the correct decision making is really about strategy and authority together. In the case of generator, <laughs> generator, I'm sorry about the mistake, the typo, with an emotional inner authority, uh, well, that generator can respond. And even when the response is there, they still need to wait to be clear, to be clear emotionally about the response. Then if they are clear, they can go ahead and act. They can go ahead and do something, connect with something, say yes to something, start some new cycle of experiences, whatever. In the case of splenic projector, as is this lower chart, uh, they're here to wait for the invitation. And their authority, which is instincts, intuition in this case rather, can spontaneously tell them if they should accept the invitation or reject it. Their, their intuition will also them, tell them if they're invited at all. And so, even though they're very fast, you know, this planet authority is the fastest of them all, you know, but they still need to wait for the invitation just because they are aware of some things. Doesn't mean they should speak about them and do something about them. They need to be recognized and invited as well. So these are just two examples of how the strategy and authority actually meets together to create this way of decision making. Now, obviously human design is very useful for looking at the charts of children. It's also very great for uh, looking at how two people relate together. I'm doing children readings, relationship readings, uh, I've done many of them. and. Um, you know, here is like a summary of what human design can do for you uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation. It, it can help you to know yourself. It brings clear orientation in life and discernment of what is correct for us and what isn't. It is mapping the natural state of our being, our gifts and talents, as well as the ideal way or the circumstances of, of their manifestation. You know, this is uh, also what we call strategy, you know, how do we get to express our unique gifts and talents? Well, by following our strategy, you know, as a generator, I can only correctly apply my life force if it's rising up in and of itself, if I function in response. Human design offers a way of decision making that does not rely on the mind and is in alignment with our energetics. It points out the path of least resistance towards the flowering of our unique potential. And it enables us to consciously participate in fulfilling of our life's mission. The reason we're here, which is, by the way, also found in the chart, something called Incarnation Cross. Now, what can you do now with all this information? First of all, you can generate your own design for free at humandesignamerica.com on the page called Char. You can also get an overview reading of your design. Uh, there are two uh, seats available on March 30th. Um, you can find all of that at the Human Design America uh, on page classes. Obviously, you can get a foundation reading from any professional uh, Analyst, uh, I'm one of them. I've done I've done several thousands of readings, uh, and uh, you can get a reading from me at humandesign.net. And you can also sign up for the Living Your Design course, which is really this foundational course of the whole human design. And um, um, it starts on April seventh. You can see all about that at humandesignamerica.com at classes. It involves 10 classes, and uh, we are going through uh, the four types and their way of functioning. You know, each type will have their own class. You know, these classes are two hours long, so we're going to go into that in much more depth, uh, into the nine energy centers, into these modes of authority and, and how, to, how to listen to it. So, so that everybody who's going to participate, and by the way, you don't need to, to have your own reading before you participate in the course. 
is, is really going to get a firm grasp of what it means for them specifically uh, to function according to their design. And, 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 you know, this whole course is geared towards supporting you in your own experience, how to translate all of that information in your daily life. There are, uh, there's going to be a lot of sharing. We're going to be using certain creative techniques. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'll be using examples on the charts of those people that are present in the class. So let me welcome you and invite you to this Learning Your Design class, this course, which begins on April 7th. And uh, we're getting to the very end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for being here, for sticking with me for these two hours. It was longer than I expected. I hope you've enjoyed that, uh, all this information, that in, in one way or another it was uh, helpful to you and, uh, or inspiring to you. Obviously, it's my way of speaking about these things. Everybody has got their own voice and everybody is unique. So this is the way I talk about it, and this is the way I, I talked about it today. I might have said different things at different times. Uh, thank you for being here. It, you know, I wouldn't be here if, if you weren't there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, wishing I wish you all the best, and perhaps I'll, I'll meet you um, on Facebook or in the courses or somewhere else. Um, yeah, thanks, and all the best to you. Take care. Bye.